keynote speaker of the day. Um, I am so, so thrilled to introduce our speaker, Director Tokes Omishakin. What a, another huge honor. Um, it's such an honor to have him here with us today. Director Omishakin was appointed the 33rd Director of the Department of Transportation also known as Caltrans, by Governor Gavin Newsom, and he was sworn in in October of 2019. Director Omishakin manages a $17.3 billion budget, nearly 22,000 employees who oversee 50,000 lane miles of highway, inspect approximately 20,000 bridges, maintain 13,000 state-owned bridges, provide permitting of more than 400 public use airports, fund three of Amtrak's busiest inner city rail services and provide transit support uh, to more than 200 local and regional transit agencies. I really can't even fathom that responsibility. Director Omishakin's transportation vision for California features a safe, equitable, and sustainable and multimodal transportation system that builds on strong local partnerships. We love that. Um, he and his leadership team established five priorities. I think we'll hear uh, a little bit about some of them for the department in 2019. And in 2020, they finalized a new strategic plan, which will focus on Caltrans foundational principles of equity, climate action, and safety. Uh, Dr. Omishak, um, Dr. Director Omishakin, born in, almost doctor, born in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, he he uh, is married with two children. He's completing his PhD in engineering management from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. He has a master's in urban and regional planning from Jackson State University and a bachelor's of art in engineering technology from, from Mississippi Valley State University. Wow. Um, well, I am just so excited to hear from you, Director Omishakin. Please, uh, without further ado, you have the, the virtual floor. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks a lot for that for that introduction. I wish people would just skip over that sometimes and we just jump right into, into discussion, but, but really appreciate that. And I appreciate you saying that um, I'm a doctor already as well. I have a PhD. My family would be jumping for joy uh, for when the day comes when I finally say I'm done. <laughs> And I'm not studying in the middle of the night for uh, for the PhD degree anymore. So it's good to be with everybody uh, at the at the Dart Symposium. This is my um, first time getting a chance to to speak to this um, to this audience to this group, and I can tell you I, I'm probably just ex excited as Andrea and, and the rest of you to uh, continue a collaboration between uh, the state. Uh, transportation entities, Caltrans, and the efforts of uh, many of you listening in who are working um, in this uh, in, in this dark space. You know, one of the questions that I get uh, very often from people when, whenever uh, I'm out and about or, or having discussions like this is, "So, what's your take on what what it what the future of transportation is? What's going to happen? What does what does transportation look like in ten and twenty years?" And I always say it's three things, um, and it's very. These three things are very much connected to the work all of you are doing. Uh, at number one, I say it's going to be multimodal, uh, meaning it's going to have to be diverse, kind of like the image that you see on your screen there. It's going to have to include lots of options uh, for people to get about. Whenever we update this image, it's going to have some uh, unmanned uh, aircrafts in there. I only see an airplane, but. Uh, it, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be multimodal. It's not just going to be cars on the road as we traditionally have uh, used transportation or trucks. It's going to be uh, it's going to be very diverse: air and land and water. Uh, next, I say uh, it, we have to invest. Uh, we have to invest in, uh, in in maintenance and operations more than we ever have. To me, I, I would argue that eighty five percent of the land sort of major uh, highway infrastructure that this country needs and this state needs is already built up. 85 to 95%, uh, 90%, I would say, of that major highway infrastructure is already there. Um, so we have to focus on investing and on maintaining and operating uh, that existing infrastructure better. We're not gonna be building giant new highways and freeways all over our communities anymore. 
Uh, so maintenance and operations number two. And number three on that list, what the future of transportation looks like, I always tell people uh, is technology based and not just autonomous vehicles connected and autonomous vehicles. I know that's where people's minds automatically go to, but technology in the sense of, uh, of, of what drones can do, what uh, robotics can do, what signals can do uh, better to help uh, access for transit for, for uh, uh, other forms of uh, other forms of vehicles. So those three things, when you think about it, the work that all of you are doing very much impacts, again, in my mind, what the future of transportation is. Uh, it, it's going to be more multimodal. That means uh, using our airspaces more, uh, more, more smartly than we are today, uh, advancing the technology around AMS, uh, maintaining and operating the system better, number two, uh, that means it, the more we can utilize our air safely, uh, equitably, uh, and in a clean manner, it's going to alleviate the pressure that we've put on our, um, the increasing pressure that we've put on our highway system. Um, and number three, again, uh, technology focused and very much drones um, and AM, uh, AM, focused, uh, AM focused approach uh, hits very much on those things. So, uh, uh, I, I'm excited about what the future holds uh, for this industry and our work and our partnership with all of you uh, in it. Next slide. So before I go into a little bit of more detail um, about uh, AM and what our uh, focus is and, uh, and our attachment to uh, advanced air mobility and the things happening there, I think it's important to set the stage a little bit about what we've been doing as a department over the last over the last two years um, and where our focus is. I overheard uh, the last speaker before me uh, as you were asked that question, Andrea, I overheard him say um, how important what we do is for people. And I was really excited to hear him say that because that's, that's where we are as a department today. Um, we're embracing this notion, this idea that even though we're an agency that's responsible for all those things that you mentioned, 50,000 miles of highways and partnering with more than 300 transit agencies, more than 250 airports, we partner with all those things. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, all this work is about people, period. Uh, that's why we do, um, that's why we do what we do. So for an, an agency that's known for this massive amounts of infrastructure to say, at the end of the day, what we really want to care about, what we care about is improving the quality of life for people, um, helping people achieve the goals that they want to achieve in, in life um, and, and uh, live a better life um, is what we're about is, uh, I, I think is, it's a new outlook. It shouldn't be earth shattering, but it's a definitely a new outlook for an agency that's so technically uh, inclined and focused. So we've laid out three guiding principles to be able to achieve those goals for people in California. Number one, equity, uh, climate action, and safety. From an equity standpoint, without going through a lot of detail, I know there's been a lot of discussion in many of many arenas about this already, but from an equity standpoint, what we're hoping is that we can help people, regardless of their, uh, their background, their ethnicity, their gender, their orientation, regardless of those things, their physical abilities, mental abilities, that we can help them get from uh, place to place, whether it be to play, to work, to worship, wherever they're going, whatever they're trying to do, that we are a part of making a brighter future uh, for them in this state. When it comes to climate action, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but we've got tremendous challenges. As you can see um, uh, across the state, we're now averaging over the last three years, we're averaging burning 2.5 million acres, 2.5 uh, million acres, again, every single year in the state. Uh, that's more than the size of Delaware that we burn every year uh, over the last three years. And finally, from a safety standpoint, our challenge there is immense. Um, we uh, unfortunately lose roughly 3,700 people on our transportation system um, every year. That's more than 10 people a day. Uh, at least three of those, or close to three of those people are vulnerable users of the system, people who are walking, biking, um, and trying to get access to transit. So you think about these three areas again, I talked about the future of transportation in those three areas. These three areas that I just outlined here that are our pillars, 
the foundational principles for the department now, technology, uh, issues around robotics and M, um, definitely help us here again as well. So uh, I, I see very much a connection and the potential for us to do more um, as it relates to, to M um, uh, in our department. Ne next slide. So to guide, um, to guide this new direction, this new focus we have uh, of those three foundational principles, we've put together a strategic plan. Uh, it took us about a year to, to finalize and complete it. We adopted it in January or February of this year. Uh, and the strategic plan is more, is the more inwardly looking uh, document uh, or plan that guides um, how we make, uh, how we're gonna be making decisions uh, within the department. So everything from, from safety, from livability and equity, uh, efficiency, uh, multimodal, building a more multimodal network, um, uh, engagement with partners, all those things are embedded in that strategic plan. Um, and again, guide how we do work from within the department. Um, and then you'll, we also have the document that you're looking at on your right, CTP 2050, that's more of a 30 year you know, document, 30 year outlook uh, uh, plan, sort of visioning uh, plan for where we're going to uh, invest in transportation. And sort of the policy uh, direction, it sets the policy direction for the state. Uh, and we developed this in conjunction with CalSTR, the California State Transportation Agency. Um, and uh, I see a question that popped up. Normally, I, I don't, I can't even see these questions, but it goes into a little bit more about uh, just in general. We'll get to questions in a second, but it goes into um, into into our role in aviation, but doesn't go into. Uh, I don't think it goes into a lot of detail on AMs or UAMs uh, a lot, but definitely addresses um, uh, aeronautics, aviation, and drones. Uh, so, good early question there. So, keep going. Next slide. Uh, what, one more book. Yeah, so Andrea in her uh, introduction mentioned um, uh, the fact that we have uh, five five priorities. Um, they, these five priorities, uh, I think, were very instrumental, I, I would say, in helping us get through some of the toughest periods this department in the States ever faced. Um, when I came on board in 2019, um, uh, I worked with our team, our executive team to say, okay, wh what, what are we gonna fo focus on every day before uh, the CTP 2050 is developed, before a strategic plan is finalized, those things are gonna take some time. It's gonna take us a year plus to finalize those documents. Where do we need to pay the most attention? And these five things uh, came about, and I'll tell you that uh, through the toughest months, through the uh, most brutal months of the pandemic and dealing with, um, those enormous fires uh, across the state, this outlook really saved the day for us because we had something to latch onto um, and had a, a little bit of a North Star uh, to, to get through those really difficult months um, in, in the early parts of uh, 2020. But, uh, and it sort of led and, and bled into, if you will, uh, for lack of a better term, into uh, our st strategic plan in CTP 2050. But these five priorities, safety, modality, having a broad modal outlook, innovation, which is what many of you here are focused on every single day, uh, becoming more efficient, again, something that is essential uh, to the future of the transportation system um, and how uh, UAMs and, uh, and AMs uh, can help with that and, uh, and partnership as well. The fact that we can't do this work alone within this huge department of 22,000 people, we still need partners to be able to accomplish many of the goals that we have. Next slide. Uh, I'm, the, the prior one, prior slide, I'm not gonna go into detail on that much because I've, I've talked, I, I think most people know where we stand already. If you could go back one slide, I'll, I'll just be very brief on that. Um, but it goes without saying, uh, our focus can't be just on continuing to uh, build out the highway network. I think, like I mentioned, we're mostly, we're mostly built out. There are some parts, uh, urban and rural, who are still doing some um, uh, efforts of building new parts of the transportation system. But I believe as a state, uh, the more a, a technology-based focus, a multimodal focus that uh, allows people options goods options to be able to get about 
um, is, uh, is very much the future and where we should be investing. Uh, next slide. So part of the reason why the work that you are doing, all of you are doing, uh, is going to be very important to the state. And I'm glad that uh, there are so many innovators um, that are investing uh, a lot of their time uh, in the space that you all are, in the dark space that you all are working on, is because of this fact, this, this issue that, that I mentioned as one of our uh, three foundational principles, and it's climate action. When you think about the challenge we have, related to this this area 41 percent of the bad air quality the ghg emissions the greenhouse gas emissions in this state comes from our sector um and a distant second at 24 percent uh, is industrial pollution um and uh, i think uh, uh, agriculture and electricity production come in next but that's how much of a challenge we have again that prior speaker mentioned uh, the cost of congestion, how many people are sitting in congestion, uh, not just people, but goods as well, uh, sitting on the back of trucks. Uh, when they're sitting there, they're uh, in many cases, uh, they're not electric, those vehicles, and they're emitting. And that's what you're seeing, right? Uh, the results of that. We have uh, roughly 250,000 people in this state, 250,000, who are people who we also consider super commuters. Uh, super commuters, if you've not heard that term before, that's people who are driving uh, 90 minutes uh, one way to get to uh, to get to work. Uh, so a quarter of a million people, and that list was growing, that number was growing pre-pandemic. Wonder what those numbers actually look like today post the pandemic, but we're climbing right back uh, to that to those levels um, uh, in as far as the VMT that we see on our highways uh, again. So we've got a, a major challenge. And again, the work that you're doing in this DART symposium and in your different companies and organizations is gonna really help us in being able to reduce um, this transportation challenge that we have as it relates to climate action. Next slide. So to, to combat this challenge, um, a, a lot of kudos is due to uh, the administration um, in, in particular, uh, Governor Newsom and how much attention he's paid to technology and uh, electrification, uh, uh, electrifying the state fleet and the, and the uh, state highway uh, highway network. So in, in two consecutive climate weeks in September of uh, 2019 and September of 2020, he released uh, executive orders uh, 1919, I believe it was in, in, in the year 2019. Uh, executive order 7920 uh, was in, in the year 2020. Uh, and executive order 1919 focused on getting us to 40% uh, uh, less GHG uh, than we had uh, in, in, uh, in levels than we had in 1990. So getting to 40% less than the GHC levels in 1990. And that by the year uh, 2030, by the year 2030, we will have 5 million zero emission vehicles on our highway system uh, as a part of the, the transportation system in the state. So in, in a mere uh, nine years, we're nine years away from needing to have um, 5 million. And for comparison's sakes, if you're wondering, uh, to date in California, we've sold uh, a little over 900,000 uh, zero emission vehicles in the state. So we're more than 4 million of vehicles uh, away from reaching, reaching that goal. Uh, Executive Order uh, uh, 7920 that came out in climate week of 2020 uh, set the goal by that by the year 2035, by the year 2035, Every single vehicle manufactured uh, and sold in California uh, should be a ZEV, a zero emission vehicle. So we're 14 years away from that, um, less than 14 years now, uh, uh, or roughly 14 years away from that goal. Every single vehicle uh, should be electric. So a lot of a lot of challenges uh, lay ahead uh, for us in this particular space, but increasingly, um, uh, I believe the work that's happening in the uh, urban air mobility space and AM space will, will, will uh, pay dividends in this growth and work as well. Next slide. 
to get there, uh, I think it's one thing to put in place executive orders and policies uh, to get to that uh, place where we want um, where we want to have more uh, electric uh, vehicles uh, um, across the state. But you can put all the policies in place that you want to. If you don't have uh, funding to support it, resources to support it, you just are not going to get there. And uh, much uh, kudos again to the administration, uh, our partners at CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and CEC, uh, California Energy Commission. Uh, they're responsible for this graphic that you see, uh, but just to, to hone in a little bit on it so you can see exactly the, the numbers uh, as far as the investment that is planned to happen. Uh, the sixth line down, CVRP, you see that line? Uh, CVRP means Clean Vehicle Rebate Program. Um, it, it has a line uh, item there, of, uh, a little over uh, uh, half a billion, $525 million uh, over a three-year period. This is key because um, as we, as people look to purchase electric vehicles more, this is the incentive money um, that's going to help people with rebates um, uh, and tax uh, tax incentives to purchase more uh, electric vehicles. Over the past ten years, this number, this particular figure was a hundred million dollars a year, and now it's all the way to a, roughly one hundred and seventy million dollars over the next three years. So a huge, a significant increase. Uh, for the clean uh, vehicle rebate program. Uh, if you're interested in this particular program, this, there's a little bit of a backlog. There's, two, there's, a, um, there's a two month backlog, uh, but the team there um, uh, is catching up. And if people apply for the CVRP program, uh, I think it, within a three month period, they should, three month period, they should be able to get their rebate uh, through this program. And the next line down from that, just briefly, clean uh, cars for all and transportation equity program. Again, mentioned how important equity increasingly is to the state of California, a uh, $150 million program to start this year and transitions to $125 million uh, and, uh, over, over the next two years. Overall, the investment, $2.3 $2 billion in, in increasing the ZEV network zero emission network uh, for the state of California. Next slide. Um, just quickly on this, uh, and then I think it transitions to AMS next, but here's again, sort of what that the ZEV uh, market looks like for California. It's the number one export from our state, if you didn't know that, uh, at a value of roughly $5.6 $5 billion um, uh, for the state. So number one valued export. Um, Chargers being installed across the state, 73 uh, chargers, uh, charging uh, locations across the state. There are 34 manufacturers in, in California uh, that are creating ZAV equipment and uh, grants and rebates now you can, for low income people in California, now goes all the way up to nearly $10,000, uh, $9,500 in rebates. Uh, 64 models available. And it represents, ZEVs now represent 9% of the entire, uh, of the entire uh, uh, vehicle uh, sale market in California today, which is pretty incredible uh, that nearly 10% of every vehicle sold uh, is an electric, uh, electric vehicle. Uh, and most of those vehicles are more technologically uh, advanced than uh, the regular uh, ICE vehicles that, we, that most of us drive. All right, next slide. Uh, innovation, again, I mentioned this already, uh, the work that you guys are, are doing in the Bay Area um, and other parts of the state, uh, I think is going to be so key to the future uh, of transportation. Now, I call California the innovation capital of the world. Um, and some people may argue against that. But uh, when you think about the work you all are doing, and uh, the work that uh, is happening in Silicon Valley related to, uh, to mobility across the board, whether it be Lyft, Uber, whoever it, it may be, even Google, um, and, and the fact that they're in the transportation business as well, um, we can't help but continue to be um, uh, the, the innovation leader. And I want Caltrans, I'm hoping our department uh, embraces innovation more and more through partnerships uh, with organizations like yours uh, listening today. Uh, next slide. 
connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, again, I mentioned early on that it will be a significant part of the future of transportation. Uh, the, uh, the growth that's happened here in this space, much of it has been led uh, by uh, Caltrans in California. We've been a catalyst in this space since the mid 1990s. We've helped to lead um, uh, this industry, the, the space. And uh, the, the potential here is immense. Uh, I think we have to be mindful of uh, some possible uh, uh, negative uh, uh, impacts on, on other modes uh, of transportation. But overall, uh, they're mostly uh, nothing but benefits uh, that will come out of uh, this space. Uh, and its connection, again, to, to the work that many of you are doing in the dark space is, is, clearly, uh, is clearly there. We at Caltrans were developing a strategic plan on connecting and autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, we're working with uh, CalSTA, the DMV, um, and a few other state agencies to put this together. But again, it sort of outlines the future, or we're hoping at least the future of connected and autonomous vehicles is with uh, OEMs uh, who are doing the, the most of the technology work um, across the state and across the country. Next slide. So uh, TISMO um, uh, is the Transportation Systems Management and, and, uh, and Operations. This is where, uh, again, I think technology can play a significant uh, role for us in, uh, in, in the decisions we make at, at Caltrans uh, on the surface transportation part. Increasingly, when you look at where the challenges are in mobility uh, as it relates to congestion, a lot of it is not actual uh, uh, issues or or things that are uh, that are that are part of the system every day. There are sort of non-recurrent challenges that cause a lot of the problems that we have. So issues related to to work zones, weather, um, accidents, or, or crashes. That's a majority, actually. When we think of, when we look at the data, a majority of the challenges we have related to congestion are in those places, uh, are in those areas like work zones and, and crashes and things like that. The more we invest uh, in technology to help us get through those uh, sort of non-recurrent issues, I think the better off we're gonna be um, in being efficient and delivering for people uh, in, in the state. A lot of time gets spent on, on investing in, uh, you know, in bottlenecks and things that are, uh, that are already set on the system. Uh, but again, technology is going to play a huge role uh, in, in helping us to, to be able to get through um, the, those non-recurrent challenges and TISMO, uh, systems management and operations through technology, is going to be a big part of that, uh, that future for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, and again, this is what I already mentioned. Uh, I mentioned before, these are the things that, uh, these are the things that are causing a lot of the challenges that we have on a transportation system. Well, some of the challenges, I should say, um, and um, issues related to incidents and weather and work zones, th those are the things that are causing uh, a lot of challenges and technology is gonna play a key role in helping us to be able to get through, uh, to be, being able to get through that. Uh, next slide. So um, AMS and advanced air mobility and uh, what uh, Caltrans uh, is uh, specifically doing in this space. I'll tell you the first time that I really ever sort of paid a lot of attention to uh, the potential here um, and, and the future that this space hold, this, uh, this part of the transportation industry holds, was probably about seven or eight years ago uh, when many of you probably saw this same episode, the episode of 60 Minutes where Jeff Bezos uh, came out and said uh, they were gonna start using drones uh, to uh, help deliver uh, packages. And drones obviously have been around for years, uh, several years before that. But it was the first time that I started to think about, wow, there's a lot of potential. There's really a lot of potential here. He mentioned, I think at the time he said, 85% of the packages that Amazon delivers are five pounds or less. And that uh, those drones would be able to, I think he said, within an hour, and I know they focus on on-time uh, on delivery, but he said, look, within an hour, 
from the fulfillment centers, they'll be able to get packages to, uh, to businesses or to homes wherever they were going. And I just remember sitting there watching it being stunned like, oh, wow, this is, this is a game changer um, as far as its potential. But what was su surprising to me from what he was saying, and if, if I'm remembering it correctly, was the 85%, the fact that 85% of the packages they deliver were 5%. Uh, weighed five, uh, five, five pounds rather, not five, five percent, five pounds or less. I know at my house, the things that my spouse orders, uh, uh, vacuums and all kinds of other big uh, furniture uh, are not five pounds. So, but uh, just understanding the fact that there's so much that could be done there. And from seven or eight years ago, whenever that aired to today, where there are several startup startups um, in the Bay Area who are now delivering packages or working on, I should say, delivering packages that are, you know, 300 to 400 pounds. Uh, I can't help but think of, uh, again, how much potential still lies here and how much we, more we need to focus here. If you know, if you've been paying attention, there is, um, uh, to this, there's a, a big challenge we have going on at, at our ports. Um, right now uh, in California, the port of Long Beach and the port of LA, um, which uh, both ports account for uh, nearly a third of all uh, uh, imports into this country. Those ports are backed up now with 60 to 70 ships uh, sitting, at the, sitting at the dock uh, there due to challenges related to, to COVID. But you know, how can this particular space, UAM's, uh, this UAM space, how can it help with uh, that challenge? N not particularly sure, uh, but uh, again, the advancements we've made from when Bezos eight years ago said, you know, five pounds or less to now being able, some of these being able to deliver close to a hundred pounds. Uh, I've seen some footage and 300 pounds worth of um, uh, uh, items. Um, this, 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 technology again what you all are working on in this space um, carries a lot of weight and so i'm looking forward to what the future holds over the next five or ten years for for this industry but to i only have one or two minutes left here but to, to talk about some of the things that we're doing very quickly and then i'll uh, hand back over so we can have some quick questions number one we're working on a vertiport uh, research project if you haven't heard of a vertiport i'm sure many of you have um, it's a little different from a heliport because it doesn't, um, uh, it, it doesn't do. We don't do any refueling, or we wouldn't do any refueling, maintenance, and repairs um, at, at, at Vertiports. Uh, but how Vertiports will work into the overall land use uh, landscape in the state, uh, how it will connect to other multimodal transportation options, uh, uh, and, and gr other ground transportation is a big part of uh, what this research, uh, Verti Vertiport research project, um, is focused on. We're also doing a, a digitization of airspace uh, re research project uh, where we're engaging uh, many of you probably, uh, experts in the, in the industry on best practices and guidelines to identify uh, 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 processes to approve uh, airspace corridors uh, for, more, um, AM, uh, for more AM travel. We're working on a, uh, a, a Symposium, another symposium similar to this with many of you in industry leaders uh, that will happen in San Francisco at, at SFO uh, in August of next year. So a little bit less than a year from now, uh, there's, a, there's a symposium called um, the Future of Aviation Advanced Air Mobility uh, Symposium that's going to happen. So uh, we're, we're working on uh, that particular symposium. Uh, EVTOL is something else that many of you are very familiar with that we're, uh, that we're focused on as well and how that technology uh, will continue, continue to help us uh, contribute to the challenges that we have um, in, in the climate action space, including issues related to uh, improving access, noise, uh, traffic, and other traffic uh, related costs that we already uh, uh, talked about. I know Joby, um, I think I saw one of the speakers earlier was from Joby. They, um, they already reached out and gave a presentation to our aviation and aeronautics department uh, in, in, the, in the last few months. So, so thanks to them for that connection uh, and partnership. And last slide very quickly, and I'll take some, some questions. Um, I mentioned how important uh, partnerships 
are to us at Caltrans. Um, we can't achieve the, the things that we're hoping to achieve for uh, the people of the state without connecting more with, uh, uh, with organizations, nonprofit, for-profit, um, uh, communities, uh, residents in the state. Uh, we can't do our work in a silo. Uh, I don't think we achieve any success by just um, uh, doing the work that we do in this department. As big as it is, as influential as Caltrans is, um, I believe uh, our true success comes when we create and build partnerships with organizations like yours. Uh, and so look forward to continuing to engage uh, in that. Uh, I know many of you know some of the players in our aeronautics and uh, aviation department, and uh, uh, they'll be glad to, and I'll be glad as well uh, to continue to engage in this particular area because uh, it very much holds uh, dividends for the future of the industry uh, and for people. So. Thank you. If you're looking to reach me, uh, my email is there and um, also recently joined uh, social media as well. So uh, two ways to connect with me. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much. Wow. Fantastic, Director Omishak. And thank you so much. Um, it was really incredibly interesting and, and really exciting to hear about the future of our state's transportation system just in general and how it relates to air mobility. Um, I, I think we're all really excited uh, to see where that all takes us. And um, just, uh, we're, we're a little bit out of time, but I, I did wanna give uh, folks an opportunity to ask a question or two. And, um, you know, one question I had uh, with respect to that last point in partnerships, um, earlier in your talk, you, you mentioned, you know, um, executive orders and policies, um, you know, and, and the funding research resources to support um, these orders or policies to sort of help um, facilitate and, and, and make those changes. And, you know, I'm wondering if you could, you could highlight the value of, of partnerships, you know, whether informal or formal with industry with respect to your, your big goals and plans that you want to achieve, um, either in general, or maybe you could uh, speak to the particular Vertiport research project in, in terms of partnerships. If, if you could talk about sort of, um, yeah, what, you know, the, the role of industry and, and maybe even academia and in, in sort of your goals and in, in making them and in, in achieving them. Yeah, uh, th thanks for thanks for the question, Andrea. So uh, again, I, I don't think we can we can get to the place we want to get to for for transportation and for livability in this space uh, for livability in general if, if we don't partner uh, with with many of you who are, are listening, whether it be, you be in a for profit, uh, non profit, uh, a, a research institution, uh, I, I think. That, uh, that growth needs to those those connections and growth uh, that growth needs to happen. So when you think about, for example, the the climate action goal that we have, we want to see GHG the greenhouse gas emissions. We want to see that, that decrease uh, across the state. We want to see vehicle miles traveled uh, decrease across the state. But we Caltrans uh, we don't own uh, and operate uh, trucks. For example, which is a big part of the emissions challenge that we uh, that we have uh, in California. There, are some I, I mentioned before that a third of the freight that ends up across the country comes from uh, comes from those two ports down in SoCal, the port of Long Beach and the port of LA, the two busiest ports uh, in, in in this country. When those when those goods come in on a ship. There's in some cases transfer to rail on the Alameda corridor. In some cases, they're transferred to the back of trucks. Um, and those trucks um, sometimes are headed to warehouses within the state. Uh, and sometimes they're headed, um, headed to the East Coast uh, out of the state. We don't own those trucks. We're not the freight industry, if you, if you will. But if we want to achieve those climate uh, related goals, which increasingly, uh, um, Again, we have a lot of uh, goods moving about on rubber wheels. That's where 90% of the freight that happens in the state still moves about 
via truck. If that's um, if that continues to be the case, we're going to have a hard time getting there. Um, and the turnover to going electric for those trucks, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time for those uh, those trucks to become fully those eighteen wheelers to become fully electric. So sitting down with industry leaders like again this symposium like uh, this this dark symposium sitting down and engaging uh, you uh, research institutions about how um, uh, uh, air mobility and this form of air mobility not just airplanes uh, can help uh, with goods uh, goods movement throughout the state uh, and potentially uh, uh, even people movement throughout the state is going to be key I know, for example, uh, in LA, as we get ready for the 2028, uh, 2028 Olympics, Uber, uh, Uber and Hyundai have been get, and engaged in the city of LA um, on how to help people move about. And, and I know it's still seven years away, but how to help people move about through air taxis um, uh, when, when the Olympic comes. But those are the kind of partnerships that we're going to continue to need from the government space, uh, partnering again with for-profit, non-profit entities on where are the challenges you have as it relates to congestion, to climate issues, uh, equity issues, uh, and trying to come up with solutions beyond the traditional uh, solutions that we go to. The traditional solution for us is if, if it's congested, let's figure out how to widen the road. We can't, we can't do that anymore. Those days are gone. And, and that's why your efforts in this industry through the private sector or a nonprofit sector are gonna be so important. Fantastic. Um, thank you once again, Director Romy Shokin. You know, we're a bit over time here. So um, I think we'll submit additional uh, questions to you by email if that's okay with you. Um, we are just so proud to have you representing and leading our state and, and in particular your leadership around like people-centered and climate-centered planning. Um, that's that's a, a really important thing to us here in the dark community um, among obviously the, the mobility and, and urban air planning for the future. Um, we really appreciate your address. Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's really an honor to have you, and uh, and we hope to to keep in communication. Thank you. Thanks a lot.